All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to just pause here for just a moment, let people come in. Looks like my audio appears to be good, so when people come in, just say hello. Say hello when you get here. All right. How are you guys doing? I'm hitting up the coffee, so hopefully I can be a little coherent. Yeah, I have added a few books. Got to um, unpack some more, and uh, my wife reminded me we need to dust the shelves before we really fill it up. So there will be more books to come. Good, good, good. Glad to see everybody. Um, this is a very strange way to, to teach because I, I really only get whatever um, username you happen to select as a, a reference point. I'm probably going to be walking around campus next semester and you'll see me and recognize me. Oh, hey. And I'll be like, ah. <laughs> so anyway, feel free if you ever do see me around campus. I'm very happy to uh, connect with you. Thanks for engaging here. It, it really does help me to know that you're actually here. Uh, for the first few minutes, it said I see zero viewers. And then eventually, I see uh, um, 38 viewers showing up here, so in my little um, screen. So it's, it really is helpful. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and I'm glad to see you here. OK, um, before, we, before we get into uh, where we picked off last time, let me go ahead and say um, you, know, you did have the first homework due and the first little participation assignment. And I understand there's a couple of issues, perhaps, with submitting the assignment, things like that. Um, I don't mind, especially right now, as you're familiarizing yourself with the way this works. Um, a couple of you had to send it in a few hours late or the next day when you realized it didn't submit, something like that. that that's no problem. For the next submission, I'm going to have it due before class next week. So I'm going to post the homework assignment tonight. Um, if at all possible, I, I have it halfway done, and then I need to work on putting it into Moodle um, in a way that's hopefully helpful grading-wise. <laughs> um, but regardless, you're going to have a week to do this. Um, should be posted tonight. It'll be due um, Tuesday before class, because then next Tuesday, what I'll do is I'll go through the homeworks with you, go through the solutions, any questions you have, um, help hope to answer any um, any questions, any issues, and work work through it with you. And that'll be sort of an exam review uh, session. Um, in addition to that, if you do need any uh, further help, I will plan to be available. Uh, I can set up a Zoom office hour type of deal to where anybody can drop in. Um, so I'm going to let you tell me if you need that. Um, and uh, I need you to remind me that you need that, and then I'll set that up for Wednesday next week before the exam. Um, regarding the, grade, the grades in Moodle, I, I sent an email, so probably you all saw this, but essentially the grade system, what I'm going to do and what I, have, what I always do is I manually enter the grades that I have looked through and finalized. The grades that you see on the Moodle assignments or even the Moodle quizzes, those are not necessarily the final grade. And in the case of an exam or a homework, chances are good you're going to be getting more points than that. Because it, on the exams, I grade for partial credit. And on both cases, there are times where maybe I made a mistake in transcribing the solutions into the, the form, and I was off by a digit or something. Um, or I see that there's a case where um, a consistent mistake was being made, but it was very close to being right, and or maybe some rounding error, and I didn't provide enough margin for error. Things like that, I want to be able to go back and add points to. So don't at all consider these finalized, what you see right now. Um, there will be a separate section labeled homework one that's not associated with an assignment or a quiz. That's the one that will be um, the actual grade that I'm assigning to you. 
and then I'm going to use those those particular grade categories when I um, when I upload and formalize your your final total grade. For partial credit on homeworks, normally what I do is I give half credit for the effort and full credit for a right answer. I might change that a little bit with the Moodle system. Um, part of that, part of the grading that way is because I feel like the assignment, the, the primary purpose of homework assignments is to give you um, sort of a mandated study, um, to force you to study the, the topic and to show me that you've worked through it and can do it. Now, sometimes that, that doesn't work out um, neatly enough, and so perhaps I'd have to add, add a little extra, but usually that's it's a decent way. Um, and so for the homeworks right now, none of the partial credit would have been added. Um, maybe there's a couple questions where I built it in, but I don't think I did it for very many. So right now, if you happen to miss every question just by a tiny little bit, um, maybe you deserve a 90, but you got a zero. Uh, so I'm going to have to take a look and um, you know, see, see how things play out. So again, don't consider that grade as, as a, a real grade. There will be partial credit, um, at least 50% for simply for effort and perhaps more than that. On exams, I, I definitely do partial credit and usually the way I I work it for exams, and I'll go ahead and write this for you, is if you have, um, let's say, a, a small, a minor, I'm going to erase this again in a moment, so I'm just using a scratch place, a minor um, calculation error. I would take off probably 10% of the credit for a problem. If that's the only thing that went wrong, you'd get 90%. You got a wrong answer, but you get 90% credit. Um, if you have multiple of those, but that's the only thing you got all the concepts right, then that would probably be 20 to 30%, somewhere in that range. Um, if you have a conceptual mistake, you had most of it correct, and then you used the wrong mass balance, or you used the wrong mass balance, but you had most of the stuff correct after that, or perhaps you um, used the wrong formula, but you had the process correct. This is usually 20 to 40% off, um, and then multiple ones of those would anywhere from 40 to 80 percent. Usually at minimum I'm giving you a little bit of effort for applying your, for showing me that you're applying your thinking and attempting to sort out where to go with the problem. So even if you just write a couple things down, I see that you're, you're thinking about it and I see where you're thinking about it, you may even get a little, a bit of credit even if you didn't do much of the problem. So that's Typically how I work with exams, I'll, I'll come back and talk a little more about this um, for, before the exam and make sure you're understanding kind of what to expect there. All right, well with that, let me come back to our topic today, which is the coagulation and flocculation. So, so far we've, we've talked about sedimentation. We looked at how, how we could model sedimentation in terms of a particle settling through the water, how do we understand the forces at play? How do we understand um, how quickly it's going to be? And, and then how to build a system that can adequately uh, make use of sedimentation for a given particle. And then we concluded by taking a look at the different particles that exist that challenge our typical um, treatment processes and you know, how, what size they are. So we'll solve a lot of problems that deal with sedimentation kind of in this particle size range. Um, maybe even some cases where it's like really difficult to settle particles over here. But essentially, if you have particles smaller than a micrometer, 
it's really not going to end up being practical to settle them with any meaningful amount of time. At some point, you get to a point where just random diffusion is preventing settling. Um, and so you, you know, we haven't investigated this in this class, but at some point you get to a, a dimension where you're not going to have settling effectively. Okay, but so this, this is the range, but the larger the better, right? The, the settling velocity, the terminal settling velocity is equal to all this stuff. And notably, this dp squared here is telling us that if we can increase the size of the particles, that's going to have a, an exponential effect on the settling velocity, right? If we can imagine trying to change the viscosity of water, um, that would, could, you know, if we decrease the viscosity, that would increase the settling velocity. You know, if something's going to drop a marble into water and compare that to dropping a marble into a syrup, it's going to fall faster through the less viscous liquid. So we can, we can say that we could change that, but that pretty much requires changing the fluid or changing the temperature. That's going to cost too much. Likewise, we might be able to change the density of the water. Same deal there. Um, so those are not, not great strategies. Um, maybe you could go to the moon and change the gravity that way, but that's not very helpful. Um, so it really comes down to changing the particle size as a way to improve sedimentation. So how do we do that? And how do we understand why particles will stay afloat in water? Well, again, we come to a force balance. Here we, we're going to talk about particles floating around in solution. And there's some question about why don't they stick to each other? Why don't they stick to the, the walls of the aquarium or the reactor? Why are they just floating around? Um, you know, there, we, you know, if you think about it, you pour some powder into a liquid, a lot of times the powder kind of sticks together, right? And then you have to stir a lot in order to break it apart. Um, and then in some cases, maybe the particles come back and stick together again. So there's some, there's some questions here, right? Well, why, what is it about, um, a material or a particle that can keep it floating around separate from other particles. Why does, why is a, a lake muddy when you pick up all the mud and why does it stay muddy if it's got kind of a, um, a muddy source water? So again, this, this whole idea of these particles floating around. Another interesting question if you've been out into the Gulf is the Mississippi's got lots of particles suspended. Well, why is it that if you go far enough, the water becomes crystal clear. And that happens all over the world. We're going to talk and, and understand exactly why, um, based on these two principles here, this force balance of two competing forces, um, the electrostatic repulsion. Essentially, if you have like charges, they're going to repel each other. And we're going to contrast that with the van der Waals forces. And this is really a group of forces that are attractive, they attract things together. Um, it's a very strong force, but it's a very, um, it's a little bit like gravity. The further away you go, the weaker this force gets, but it gets weaker really, really quickly. Um, the same thing is true of electrostatic repulsion. The further away you get, the weaker the force, but it's, it's a slower decay of the, um, it's a slower decay function. So it's, you know, if you were to look at the equation for gravity, you have some constants up here, and then you have the radius from, away from the massive body. And then maybe if somebody knows or can Google this for me, um, this, that radius is raised to some exponent, right? It's squared or it's cubed or something. Well, I believe the electrostatic here is one over radius squared, whereas the van der Waals is one over radius to the six or to the fourth or something. It's a much bigger number. So the point being that um, you have to be very close for the van der Waals to be 
the stronger of the two forces. Okay, so we have particles. And what I'm going to show you here is if we put a negative charge on the surface of these particles, which is it's actually pretty common. Um, there's a few reasons for it, but the typical particles in solution happen to have negative charges. There's a lot of surface chemistry, um, a little bit of conjecture, but uh, we know a lot about why this happens. It depends a bit on pH as well. Um, so you can manipulate this in a lot of cases. So we have this, these particles and they have this innate surface charge. Um, it's as if you, you took a balloon and rubbed it on your hair, if you have hair, and then it's got that charge, right? And it, you can see that it's um, attracting different objects based on electrostatic interactions. Well, these particles just happen to have a little bit of charge. And what happens in water is they become surrounded by ions. So these negative charges then attract positive ions. So, and when I say positive ions, I'm talking about maybe H plus or Na plus more, you know, more often we're going to have more sodium or um, calcium, magnesium, potassium, oops, not Ka, just K. So potassium is K plus. Calcium is Ca2 plus. Aluminum is another one we often use for, because it has three plus. And so these charges, um, essentially what they're going to do is they're going to make a layer right on top of that negative surface charge because of the ions themselves are attracted um, by electrostatic forces. So this is going to happen on both sides. And we're going to get a nice uniform association here. And then we're going to have a third layer, or really a second layer of ions, with negative charged stuff. So with negative, it could be potentially OH minus, but again, that's going to depend a lot on the pH. More, more likely it'll be chloride, Cl minus. It could be other halides like bromide. It could be sulfate, SO4, 2 minus, um, or some other anions, right? And so we're going to add in the negatives here. A lot of salts have chloride as the counter ion. This one's going to be a little bit more loose, right? There's going to be some positives floating around because at this point it's, there's a lot of diffusion, a lot of motion. It's a weaker attraction at this point, this far away from you know, that double layer. All right, so we're forming that double layer here. And so we have this whole system where we have two layers of ions added to the surface of these particles. And that makes the range at which this electrostatic propulsion is going to increase that range into, this, into the water further. And so this is acting like a barrier because now we have electrostatic repulsion pushing away because we see the negative, the net negative surface here, this is kind of a negative charged surface, is pushing away against this negative charged area. And so these two electric fields are just pushing one another away. So this is the electrostatic. And we call this, this occurrence the electrical double layer. And so the fact that we have the surface and then a double layer of ions, that's what we call this EDL or electrical double layer. And it turns out that the, the extent to which this layer extends out into solution um, really dictates how far this electrostatic repulsion goes. Um, we can imagine a situation, so you see all these ions here, but we can also imagine a situation, we have the, the same negatively charged surface, 
And we can imagine a situation where there's very, very few ions in solution. So based on the simple osmotic pressure, the fact that in water or in a liquid, the osmosis or the osmotic pressure says, basically says that we, water is always going to want for the ions to be equally distributed throughout the whole solution, right? If you had a, a membrane, you know, this is um, the whole osmosis thing. Um, if you have a membrane that can let water through but not salt, the water is going to go towards the salty water to try to equilibrate itself. Well, the same thing applies, right? If you have um, very, very few ions around, you're going to get the same layer happening, but everything's going to get pulled further and further away because the, the lack of ions in solution is just pulling at it. And so it's, this gradient is just pulling the ions away, extending and expanding that electrical double layer further. Okay, so we'll talk about that more in a moment with some uh, graphs and examples. Um, but so there's this concept of that electrical double layer may have some distance that's important. Okay, so I'm going to uh, erase just a little bit of this stuff. Now, the other force is that van der Waals force um, or the van der Waals forces. So the, the attractive forces, they're essentially, they have to do with um, nuclear forces. So a, a, the nucleus of an atom has an electron cloud. And when that electron cloud interacts with some other nu nucleus and its electron cloud, they tend to stick together. Um, so they're very short range type forces and there's a group of different forces. That's just one example. I don't remember the others off the top of my head, but there's several forces like that where they'll stick together if close enough. This is actually exactly the, the type of forces that geckos use to climb on um, surfaces that have no friction, right? If you see like a perfectly clean glass or polished surface, and a gecko can climb on it. Well, it can do that because it's using these van der Waals forces in the, in the little pads of its feet, um, making that contact and using that that type of force to bring that attraction. Now, it's not like a it's not like it's a reaction where the force then like tears anything to tear it back apart, um, but it is it's it's like a magnet, right? It's a strong force that um, occurs. Uh, when the right conditions are present. Okay, so with that, the, you know, thinking back to sedimentation, what we want is to have large particles. When the particles are stabilized this way, they're, when I say stabilized, they're not sticking together and then falling, right? That instead a stable suspension is they do not stick together, they kind of bounce back off of each other, and they remain um, as they are. That's what we're referring to when we say stabilization or destabilization. So then the point of our coagulation is going to be to overcome this electrical double layer and to somehow cause these, this, these particles to stick together, maybe promoting the van der Waals forces or demoting the electrical double layer. Okay, so here's just another depiction, another way we can um, take a look. A little bit better graphics here, but just wanted to, to show you this. And then you see here, they also have drawn the bulk liquid where it's just a random mixture of, of ions kind of in this area. And then that double layer is really everything that happens. You know, you can kind of see that definition here where the solid surface has some negative charge, it's attracted ions of both types, and that's effectively our double layer there. It turns out we can actually measure fairly well the distance 
from the surface to the end of where we can feel the electrical potential. So we're gonna see some distance in nanometers. Um, we're gonna be able to measure, we'll say can measure, cannot spell, but we can measure, right? Um, let me uh, just rewrite that for you. We can measure, I think it's just that I can't spell and talk at the same time, or I have, have a hard time. So we can measure um, really the electrical potential. And a lot of times we'll call the electrical field um, capital E. at a distance. So we can measure that electrical potential at some distance from the surface. And that gives us an idea of how, how far into the bulk solution are double layers extending. That's going to tell us how strong and how much distance is going to be between our particle and the next particle. Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to look at a few graphs here, and I know there's a lot of details, probably too much to take in all at once. So I'm going to come back to that idea of measuring that potential as a function of distance. We've got two graphs here. Um, before we do that, I want to take, take a look at this bigger graph and walk you through it. So what we have here is the dose of some coagulant. So a coagulant the goal of our coagulants is to destabilize the particles, cause them the particles to settle. And the way we can do that, the way we can observe what's happening is to measure what we call turbidity. Now, if I were to be mean to my fish and stir up the bottom of the tank, all the different bacteria and algae that are around would start floating around and we would end up with, um, instead of a nice clean, clear tank here, with the fish kind of happily chilling there. Instead, it would be kind of murky. And it would, we, we would see a lot of particles, um, you know, the, the light wouldn't be as clear. Uh, and maybe I should do this for you. That might be a good example. But essentially, um, that clarity, the water clarity is showing us that there's no, there's few particles suspended in there. Or if it's muddy and you can't see very far through it, that we call that turbidity. Um, and it, we measure it by seeing how far through the water light can travel. And you can see straight through my aquarium here, and it's a 28 gallon tank. And so that's probably two feet of water, maybe two and a half um, distance wise, and you see straight through it to the, um, the wall back there. Okay, so. With turbidity in mind, what you can do as an experiment to see how well your coagulant is working is you can say, all right, we've got some turbid water. Grab some water from the Mississippi or your local bayou, and it's got a lot of mud in it. Or, you know, or if it doesn't, make sure you, you grab a sample that does. Um, and it's, it's mud that doesn't just settle out in a couple minutes, right? It's just suspended solid there. So you take that, and then you apply your coagulant. And you want to know how much coagulant you need before it becomes clean. So we start off with 100% of the turbidity we started with is still there. Then we're adding more and more coagulant. And you see here this log scale. And so we're, then we're going to try different coagulants to see how they work. So we're adding and we go and we go until we see it drop in the sharp drop here, that's when the turbidity goes from 100%, so very murky, down to very, very clear. And it, you know, on a scale as we're adding more and more dose, it's almost instant. So for aluminum, which has a three plus charge, this feature happens, this, uh, this destabilization and the, this causing of coagulation happens at about 10 milligrams per liter of aluminum. Um, so not, not a whole lot there. So 
essentially what's happening is by adding more salt, we are compressing the double layer. You know, like I mentioned earlier, this on the right or in the middle here is a saltier condition with more ions around than this one over here. Okay. And another thing to note is that, let's use over here as an example, if you have three, you know, if you have all your negative charges <clears throat> and then you have one ion with three pluses, that one ion can satisfy a lot of charge. And so that's another way in which it's shrinking the area because then, you know, you really only need a few of these ions and they're actually pretty small. Um, that, that feature is collapsing the electrical double layer much quicker per ion per atom of aluminum, for example, in solution. And yes, as, and, and thank you for the question. As I, when I say salty, what I'm talking about is the presence of more ions. Because salt, you know, the, what we think of as table salt, right, is NaCl. NaCl, when we put it in water, gives us Na plus and Cl minus. That's not the only version of salt. There are other salts, but, and I'm sorry, I got that in the way. So there, there are certainly other salts um, more than just NaCl. You know, we could look at um, CaCl2 goes to Ca2 plus and 2Cl minus. Now we're going to talk about a concept called ionic strength in just a moment that should help clarify this, um, what I'm talking about here, but uh, these are just example salts here. And we can use salt to destabilize particles. Um, and so I mentioned kind of at the beginning that we can better understand what happens when the Mississippi flows out into the ocean and if you go far enough out, the water becomes clear, even though the Mississippi was so dirty. Well, one thing that's happening is we have all of this salt compressing the double layer on all the particles, and the particles then start to stick together and settle out a solution. Okay, so this effect with the three plus in a small ion, so, you know, when I was drawing it, I drew three different pluses, and it's a bigger circle that I had to draw around it. That's not very accurate. Um, more accurate would be to say it's pretty much the same size, but it's three times the charge compared to like sodium, right? There are small differences in sizes, but effectively it's just really dense charge there in comparison. And so when we, we have aluminum and then we compare that to calcium with a two plus charge, we need 10 times the amount to get um, the same effect, that same coagulation effect and reduction in the turbidity when we add calcium. Now, if we want to see sodium, we have to go all the way up from 100 to 10,000 um, to have the same impact for sodium, have, using sodium as a coagulant. So we see here immediately that aluminum, if we can use that, it's going to be cheaper. It's going to make our water less salty. So if we wanted to treat an aquarium, um, which I don't think is very common to do, but let's say you did, or maybe a pond or something, or drinking water that you want to treat, you want to drink eventually, salt is typically pretty hard to remove out of the water. So we don't want to make our water salty, and certainly adding 10,000 milligrams per liter, um, that's pretty close to salt water. So um, that's saltier than the Lake Pontchartrain. Um, Lake Pontchartrain typically is around, uh, between, depends on where you are in it, but somewhere around three to five, um, somewhere in that rough range, grams per liter of salt. And this is 10 grams per liter here. So certainly that's uh, not tenable for drinking and not practical for the amount of um, 
salt you have to add. Okay, so I wanted to go ahead and paint that picture here so we kind of see um, how these are comparing. And really this is, again, going to be a function of that, what we call the ionic strength. And I showed you kind of pictorially why that works, because the, the same ion, about the same size ion, takes up and occupies and satisfies a lot more charge um, than it would have otherwise. Okay, so then we have these two other graphs. And since you might be more interested in looking at a fish than a graph, we'll put that back. Um, so these two other graphs here. This is what we were talking about when I said you can measure the electrical field um, some distance away from the surface. So we have the surface right here. Um, and I'll draw that, you know, just typical convention drawing kind of a surface like that or something. So we see the surface and then at some distance away, we are measuring the electrical potential, the electrical field. And then we're, what we're doing is we're checking on using sodium chloride, which we know is not super effective, but we're using different concentrations of it to see how that's affecting the distance of this electrical double layer. So when we have fairly um, clean water, this would probably be approximately fresh water, 60 milligrams per liter of sodium chloride, we see this electrical double layer has a very strong potential all the way up to like the highest strength all the way up to 10 nanometers and still has pretty strong effects all the way out to 15 or perhaps even 20 nanometers you can still feel it and it actually extends quite far um, with with some observation of the um, of the field now when you take 10 times that amount of salt we see here the really high high potential force here is really all the way down at um, you know maybe four three or four nanometers or excuse me this was uh, this guy maybe four or five nanometers, something like that. Um, and you can still sense a pretty strong one, five, six nanometers, and even out all the way to 10 nanometers away from the surface, you're still getting a, a reasonably large um, potential energy there from, from that we can measure. Get 6,000 milligrams per liter, you're still a several nanometers out of the solution. Um, maybe you're starting to destabilize particles here, but you're, you certainly still can see that effect out there. And whatever particles were being removed here, that the 6,000 <clears throat> uh, was just getting to the point where maybe it was enough, right? Because this is 1,000 on the log plot, 2,003, 4. Do I have that right? 5, 6, 7. I don't think I have that right. Um, but you can expect 6,000 is some, somewhere around this range, right? So maybe you're starting to destabilize them, but not all of them. <clears throat> okay, the other way to look at this, the same effect, um, instead of changing the amount of sodium chloride, we changed it from sodium chloride, maybe to calcium chloride. The Z here, that's the charge, the charge of an ion, um, as it says here. So if we go from sodium to calcium to aluminum with the same amount of um, amount of the uh, ion, then we see a very big difference here just by changing the charge, right? So let's just compare at 40 millivolts here. This is with a three plus charge, it's probably a pretty low concentration here, maybe one or two, maybe five milligrams per liter or something. Um, this is uh, out at six nanometers or so. Um, the calcium is up at like 10 nanometers, and then the sodium is up near 20 nanometers. So certainly a big, a big deal there in terms of how far or how compressed is the, uh, the electrical double layer that's really controlling the particle stability um, 
given these uh, the difference in charges. Okay, so this brings us to ionic strength, and this is the last new chemical, um, new chemistry topic that I need to cover for you. And I didn't, I didn't really cover it during our chemistry review because I, I knew we were going to come to it, and it truly is relatively simple. Um, it's instead of counting the just the straight up concentration of stuff, we are accounting for the charge of the of the stuff that we have, right? So the ionic strength here, we say I is equal to one half times the sum of the different concentrations times their charges squared for different ionic species. Um, this should be lowercase i. So the thing here is we're counting the charge. Remember that if you if you were to take a particle and take a look, you would actually have a discrete number of charges per particle or on the particle. And so when you look at the interaction of ions, we have to do it on a numbers basis. Um, so this has to be molar cal calculations or molar units. And essentially we're doing molar units of charge. And so this equation is really just saying, okay, for every different species uh, of C and its given charge, we need to sum them and with the square of their um, of their charge, so even if it's a negative charge, it becomes a positive term in our equation because it's squared. And then we take half of that, and that's our ionic strength. And if we increase the ionic strength, we are decreasing the electrical double layer and compressing it down shorter, like we just saw. And so that's the way we can um, manipulate our system. Okay, so we have an example problem here, and I'm going to encourage you to, to solve this, make sure that you are um, confident in solving this. It's also some very basic chemistry practice here, doing a conversion, um, you know, molecular weights and all that. I will, I will pull up um, the molecular weight for you in just a moment, but now's a good time to pause if you wanted to go ahead and do this all on your own. Uh, feel free, I'll walk with you through it in just a moment. Okay, so we have magnesium chloride, and I, I'm giving you here that it's, it goes to Mg2 plus and the two chloride minuses. So if we have 100 milligrams per liter of MgCl2, then what I'm asking you to do is find the molar concentration of Mg2 plus, the molar concentration of chloride, And then while you're at it, you needed to do those anyway um, to solve for I, and then we solve for I, okay? So let me go ahead and pull up a periodic table, or maybe I'll just grab the... Um, from the internet here. Okay, so the molar mass here of MgCl2 is 95.211 grams per mole, according to Wikipedia, which we all know is so reliable, right? Um, and just to remind you as well, chloride is 35.45 grams per mole, 
And if we look up MG2+, plus, probably should just get a uh, periodic table up. The standard atomic weight here is 24.3 grams per mole. All right, so with that, um, we should be able to solve. And so first what we need to do is um, we recognize that one mole of magnesium chloride goes to one mole of magnesium and two moles of chloride. So we have a molar conversion there, a stoichiometric um, conversion there. So first of all, we need to know how many moles of magnesium chloride did we add in the first place. So let's do that. I'm going to go ahead and convert this to grams because it's going to be easier to work in grams. So 100 milligrams is equal to 0.1 grams MgCl2. And we can divide this by the molecular weight, 95.211 grams per mole. This gives us um, some amount of magnesium chloride in moles. So 0.1 divided by, so 1.05 times 10 to the minus three. That's how many moles per liter. Oh, that's how many, yeah. Sorry, I, I left off the liters here. I should have kept the liter. So we've got 1.05 times 10 to the minus third moles per liter. Okay. From there, we say that um, Mg2 plus. Is going to be equal to the same amount. Um, well, let's write it a little differently, right? So we can say one mole Mg2 plus is equal to one mole of MgCl2, right? Because that you know, we had that one to one molar conversion, and therefore we had that many moles per liter. This is also going to be equal to Mg2 plus because it was a one-to-one -one conversion, and we can do that directly. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense for you. Again, always feel free to stop and ask. We're gonna do the same thing with the chloride, except this time one, and I'm gonna, I'll write it differently. So one mole of uh, MgCl2, equals two moles Cl minus. So that means that for every one of these, we have two chlorides. So the chloride concentration equals two times 1.05 times 10 to the minus third moles per liter. So I'm just doing this in my head, but that should be two point one, which is 2.10 times 10 to the minus 30 moles per liter. Okay, so then we're, all we need left is ionic strength. I think I've got more space on the next slide. Uh, no, okay. So we're going to do the ionic strength here then. So we said ionic strength equals one half times the different species, right? So We'll take the first one, magnesium 2 plus. It's molar concentration. Make sure this is molar, right? You can't use 100 milligrams per liter here. It has to be the molar concentration. Times its charge, 2 squared, plus the concentration of Cl minus, times its charge, negative 1 squared, all that. Okay, so then 
i then is going to be equal to we had this number was um, the magnesium so we're going to have this one times 2 squared which is 4 or times 4 so that's this first component here then we're going to add another amount which is the chloride and that's going to be just multiplied by one so we're going to add and i'm just going to do this this way two one zero because that's 2.10 times 10 to the minus third that's this guy so i'm adding that so now i've done this term plus this term and now i just need to take half of that So this should be our ionic strength then. 3.15 times 10 to the minus third. And in a way we can use moles per liter that would be kind of like moles charge per liter. And if we look here, we have moles per liter. Uh, the charge, I guess, is maybe some sort of units, uh, not really units. Um, it's a little bit like moles of charge per liter. Um, so if you want to think of it that way, you can. So that would be, those would be our answers then. And again, if you had any issues with that, um, make sure to, to go back and review the, the basic chemistry of converting. The formula itself is very simple. The only place you might get confused are the Z's and if you have multiple sources of the same ion. I see people get confused about that a fair bit. So Z, um, and absolutely thank you for the question here. So Z equals the charge. So when I say Mg2 plus, Z equals F plus two. When I say Cl minus, <clears throat> Z is equal to negative one. I don't write Z with that. Why did I do? Okay, so it's very simple. Z is the the charge of that particular ion. And then in the ionic strength equation, we square it, so it doesn't matter that it's uh, negative. No problem, sorry, I was not clear about that. Okay, so one more problem here. I, I recommend you definitely take a moment to at least write out the equation. So we have 50 milligrams per liter of MgCl2 and 50 milligrams per liter of NaCl. So when you solve this one, you have NaCl, and this is going to Na plus and Cl minus. You also have MgCl2, like we just did, um, where we get Mg2 plus and 2Cl minus. So um, with 50 milligrams of each of these, you're going to have two different sources of chloride and you're going to have sodium, and you're going to have magnesium. Okay, so take a moment and at minimum on your own, write out what you think this equation looks like. All right, so fill that in on your own, just with, you know, don't, you don't need the numbers just yet, although I, again, encourage you to do that. But make sure that you write out what happens inside here. Because this is going to be important. I see people confuse this more often than, than should happen. Okay. In the meantime, I'm going to pull up a periodic table so we can get a lookup table going. And then I'll, I'll solve this with you in just a moment.
Okay. So I've got a periodic table here. And we need sodium. I'm going to make this a little bigger. So sodium is 22.99. We'll probably just call that 23. Magnesium is 24.3. And chloride is 35.45. Those are the only ones we need. Okay, so I'll go ahead and write those up and we'll go ahead and solve. <coughs> So we've got those. Now, um, when we go to solve, we have 50 milligrams per liter. So that's 0 0.5, excuse me, 0 0.05 grams per liter. And let's go ahead and do the magnesium chloride first. Last time we saw this was Molecular weight was 95.24. And let me let me go ahead and make this clear. So molecular weight of NGCl2 is 95.24. Molecular weight of NaCl is probably should remember this off the top of my head 58.54 okay. so by now you should have filled in this and I recommend you fill this in first and then go to solve the pieces. So I've written a few things down here. And in fact, maybe I'll go ahead and finish getting the, um, essentially the MgCl2 concentration that was added of mole per liter. Um, it's not right to actually put brackets around it because it's not dissolved in that form. It's dissolved as Mg2 plus and Cl2 and 2Cl minus. So what I'm going to say instead is moles, moles C, C, MgCl2 per liter that was added is equal to this, right? Because grams, that should have been a division. Excuse the mistake there. Should be dividing, right? So we need to get rid of the grams. We want liters at the bottom, and we want to get rid of the grams and send moles to the top. So it needs to be division. So 0 0.05 divided by 95. Let me get the calculator. This will come. Okay. 0 0.05 divided by 95.24. So 5.25 times 10 to the minus 4. Sorry about that. Okay, so that would be that many moles per liter added. Then moles NaCl per liter added. We're doing the same thing, 58.54, um, 0 0.05, so we have the same starting amount, grams per liter divided by 58.54. By four grams per mole. So here, do this again, 0.05 divided by 58.54, we get 
8.54 times 10 to the minus 6. And this will be moles per liter again. Okay, so we have that. Now we need to figure out what we need in our equation. So like I was saying, hopefully you filled this out and I want to point out a possible mistake that you've made. So when we're summing the different species, let's just go ahead and start through the system. So we, we need magnesium, Mg2 plus, times its charge squared, and then we're going to add the next one, Cl. So we, we know this is dissolving at Cl, 2Cl minus. So this is going to be the concentration of Cl minus times its charge squared. Now, keep in mind, this 2 informs what's in here. Okay, so you don't need to account for that 2 anywhere else. That's just going into here. Um, Okay, next thing in line is the sodium. And so then we need the Na plus times its charge squared. So plus one squared. Let me rewrite that. And then you might be thinking to yourself that, oh, we also have the chloride here. And so then we would add plus Cl minus again, you'd be wrong. Because here's the thing, there's only one concentration of chloride, and I'm gonna to answer your question in just a moment. We only have one concentration of chloride. Both sources of chloride add into the same one, right? When we say the concentration of chloride, that's the concentration in the whole system. That's not the contribution of one salt dissolving. That's the total concentration here. So this is not how you do it. Instead, when you calculate this here, you need to have inputs from both places, okay? So be careful when you're solving these to make sure that your chemistry is correct. This is, it would not be correct to duplicate the chloride here because it's, um, it's expressing the concentration that is in solution total. Okay, so question here is, could you write 2Cl minus in brackets? Would that, would that be the wrong notation? Yeah, that was absolutely the wrong notation because, again, what we're looking at... Okay, perfect. Yeah, so essentially, it, it, that's the same, the same uh, confusion there possible, um, is that what we're doing is we're ultimately solving for the molar amount of Cl minus. That's particular species. So we never... We never put the two in front of the brackets like that. We might do it if we have, you know, SO4, two minus. You'll see a four in there as a subscript or maybe in the charge, but you'll never see one as the, that number because this is referring to some number of molecules anyway. And the prescript there, that number is always within a molecular reaction denoting the number of moles. Uh, on a ratio basis. And so the fact that this is denoting the number of moles by the brackets, um, we, ju we just never see it that way because it doesn't make sense. Um, but I totally understand the, the confusion, which is why I wanted to point this out and make, make this clear. Okay, so spending, spending this amount of time here, I'm, I'm happy to do and to make sure that we're clear here, um, but We'll basically have to cover um, the rest of flocculation on Thursday, which we, we can do it. So relatively simple. Okay, so let me let me go through this then and finish this off. So like last time, we have the magnesium component and the chloride component. I'm going to take a slight shortcut. I do know that we added half the amount of magnesium as last time. So well, actually, we already have it solved anyway. So we know that that's one-to-one -one magnesium to magnesium chloride. So this is going to be equal to that 5.25 times 10 to the minus fourth moles per liter. 
I'm going to do the next simple one. Sodium is going to be um, the same that we solved right here. That's 8.54 times 10 to the minus fourth mole per liter. And then chloride here, what I'm going to do is to solve it. And I'm going to look at the contributions, right? We've got um, essentially two from the MgCl2. So two from this reaction and one from this reaction, right? That's the one here and the two here. So what I'm just, I'm just gonna write it all out first and I'm gonna say two times the 5.25 times 10 to the minus fourth mole per liter plus the one times 8.54 times 10 to the minus fourth mole per liter. Okay, and then when we sum that, the Cl minus is going to equal, let's get a calculator again. So it's going to be two times 5.25 plus 8.54. And then essentially this is, I, I need to add the times 10 to the minus fourth to this answer. Um, so this will be 1.9 times 10, oh, yeah, so this will be 1, 1 1.9 times 10 to the minus third moles per liter. Okay, and we see that two times five should be 10, so that's gonna change the exponent by one. Um, and then adding most of that again gives us the 1.9. All right. So with that, then we can solve the ionic strength equation and put in those numbers and get the answer. So I'll let you do that. I have every confidence that you can plug in those numbers um, and get that answer. I'll let you do that on your own. Okay. So any questions or concerns with that, please, please let me know. Um, I will introduce the concept of flocculation in the next several minutes, and then we'll get into the math and calculations in terms of uh, understanding what's happening in the flocculation process next time. Okay, so when we have destabilized our particles, now that we have some, some understanding of that, the next thing to do is really to give the solution time for the particles to stick together. And we see this little um, picture here where we have some murky water, maybe this algae or something like that. And the particles are stirred gently and given time to collide, and then they can start settling. So the flocculation is during that process where we're gently mixing. The idea here is to allow the collisions without breaking them apart. So we are um, essentially reducing N, reducing the number concentration of particles over time. N is that number concentration of particles. If we're reducing N, we're making larger particles. So what we want to do is in some volume of water, we have a bunch of little particles, okay? There's maybe seven or eight particles there. Our flocculation, the goal is to then take those and stick them together into one larger particle. Um, and essentially what's happening here is N is reducing. So N literally is the number of particles per liter or per square meter or something like that per volume. Um, so if our number is decreasing, then our size is increasing because we're not getting rid of them in any other way. We're just colliding them and causing them to aggregate. So then the question becomes, how quickly does this process happen? How can we model that? In the K for this decay reaction um, will depend on a few variables. 
one thing we'll notice is that this is going to be a first order decay reaction. We know it's going to be first order decay because we know the particles have to meet each other. So it does depend on particles. And we know it's decay because, because they're sticking together. The number of them will be decreasing. So one of the um, one of the pieces to the puzzle is what we call the mixing intensity. Now the mixing intensity is really um, has to do with how quickly um, you are stirring a system. So if I were to take my little pen thing and stir my water, I put a lot of energy into it, it'll get the water moving quite quickly, we'll have a high mixing intensity. If I were to take the same pen, same amount of energy, and put it in my aquarium, we'll have some mixing, but it's not going to be as much. So that aspect, that effect of stirring is captured in what we call mixing intensity, or G. It's related to the square root of the power that we put into the system, so power in watts, divided by the viscosity of the solution times the volume of the solution. So I just painted the picture for you with the aquarium versus my cup of water. One is going to get stirred a lot more intensely than the other based on the volume. Now you could also consider trying to stir honey versus stirring water. The same amount of power, you're going to get a lot more stirring action from the water. Again, that's, that's bringing in the viscosity component. Um, the other day I tried to, well I did, stir a one of those cans of peanut butter that's um, like the natural mineral hyd hydrogenated oils added or whatever so it ends up with like a, a layer of peanut oil at the top and then the rest of it and um you know it, it takes a lot of a lot of stirring to get there um so either you have to increase the power or you're you know you're um you're just not getting as much mixing intensity so uh the way to understand this conceptually is if you have some surface here and the surface is maybe my my pen or the knife blade stirring in the um, stirring in the fluid whatever it is it's moving or you could even imagine the like the surface of my glass or the aquarium some surface but we can look at how water is moving beside it and if we have water moving at some speed right up next to the surface, we'll note that as you're getting further and further away from the surface, it's getting faster and faster. Um, because close to the surface, we have the force of drag, which is a, you know impacted by the viscosity, so that we end up with some gradient here. And I probably should have drawn more of a straight line here, but there's a, a gradient that we can we can calculate and we can call this the partial derivative of how the velocity is changing as a function of distance. So if y distance away from the surface is changing, we have this partial partial derivative of how that velocity is changing. Um, Anyway, this is the definition of G, the mixing intensity. Um, so that's kind of pictorially what it means. And effectively what it means is how intense is the mixing on a per time basis. So if you were to look at these units, they come out to be per time and per, specifically per second because power um, in watts is a per second unit and we have per second units in our viscosity term. And because we're dealing with meters here in the this term, and then newtons and meters are required for joules, which is watts or joules per time, or time to time. Um, essentially, our volume then also must be in cubic meters. Okay, so watch the units here as you're doing the problems. Uh, make sure that again that you're always using consistent units. G should always be in per second um, units. Okay, so that's 
I think about all I want to cover today. Um, next time we'll pick up here and we'll start looking at solving equations with um, flocculation, how to find K and then how to apply it to understand how N changes with time and what that means for um, the size of a particle. Okay, so with that, um, any questions, comments, or concerns, um, feel free to put them in chat. And while you do that, either go on and have a good day or stay and watch the fish eat some food for a second. And I'll be, I'll be watching in case you have any questions. I guess I scared it. All right, well, have a good day. Um, I guess I'll keep this open for a moment while I close out my slides for today. <laughs>